بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله الذي أنعم علينا بنعمة الإسلام والصلاة والسلام على محمد النبي الخاتم الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Subhanallah, Allah has gifted us with the gift of life to humanity because that is the gift of Islam. Islam, if properly understood, it is nothing short of the primordial gift that Allah gave to Adam and Eve and that Allah gave to the patriarch, the father of all prophets, the Prophet Ibrahim and all the lines of prophets to the sons of Ibrahim, Isaac, Ashaq, and Ismail and made the Nubuwa, the prophethood, in the lines, in the familial lines of the descendants of Ishaq, Isaac, and the descendants of Ismail. To culminate in the prophecy of Muhammad the final prophet. We enter the month of Dhul Hijjah, one of the most central months, central months of all the annual calendar, the months of, of pilgrimage. One of the things that have always struck me about the way that the Quran tells us what the message and mission of the Prophet Ibrahim and the Prophet Muhammad is the the kind of wording that the Quran uses to situate us, to, to make us, in many ways, to reshape our consciousness, to reshape our attitude about what these prophetic missions are about. And especially the, the amazing links between that most fascinating unfolding where the Prophet Ibrahim salam, takes his son Ismail and goes to an area in the vast desert and establishes a place A place, the Iqamat Dhikrillah, and my khutbah, inshallah, today will focus on this word Iqamah. So, when Allah talks about the Prophet Ibrahim, السلام, it tells us in Surah Ibrahim that. The Prophet Ibrahim says, رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذِرِّيَّتِي بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي ذَرَعَ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Allah, Prophet Ibrahim is reported to say, Allah, I have now brought to my family, brought my family to an arid and barren place 
Baytik al Muharram, your holy home, your holy abode, Mecca, the, the area of the Kaaba today. Liuqimu as Salah. Liuqimu as Salah, to establish prayer. And the word here that deserves pause is the word Iqamat al Shaykh. Qiyam Now, it didn't say to pray, didn't say liu sallu. It didn't just say to pray, but it goes beyond that and it says to establish prayer, liu qimu as salah. Similarly, Again, on the um, on behalf of Ibrahim السلام, when Allah says, "Rabbi ij'anni muqim al-salah wa min dhuriyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua," Allah make me among those who do what yuqimu al-salah and accept my supplications, and in fact. When we ourselves pray, we, the, the proper way to refer to what we do is iqamat we, as-salah. We, we do the act that I'm going to elaborate upon in a second of qiyam as-salah. We do this act of rising to prayer. Similarly, when Allah describes the legacy of the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, جعل الله كعبة البيت الكعبة البيت الحرام قياما للناس جعل الله الكعبة البيت الحرام قياما للناس a place, qiyam linnas, a place where people rise. Now, normally, we, we understand these to refer simply to prayer. But why does Allah always refer to the area of the Kaaba as a place of qiyam and refer to prayer itself, salah itself, as an act of qiyam? The examples of this are, are numerous. So even when Allah refers, God refers to God's own past, God refers to it as muqim, that it is a path where you do what? A muqim, a, a, and I'll elaborate on this. So, what is, what is that word, qiyam? When we when Allah exhorts us throughout the Quran, aqimu salah wa atu zakah, repeatedly, Allah exhorted us to establish prayer. So, what is qiyam? What what is what is that word? The root word of it is qiyama. Qima, from that same word is the the root word for qawm, qiyam, qawman, the many derivations on the basic root of qaf ya mim, or qaf wa mim, depending on the, the tense that we're using. Now, literally, it means to stand up. And when we stand in prayer, we are in a state of iqama. So we say, aqam as salah rise up and establish prayer. And when you say, I stand up for prayer, you say, I'm going to start prayer, you say, qum to as salah The word that 
basic three letter word that has various derivations that connote various meanings. All refer to the act of rising up, rising up, but not just rising up as in standing, but rising up full of vigor and life, full of vigor and life. So from that is also the word derived the word qiyam, which means values, or qima, which means a value. So when we say the value of money, we say qima al-nuqud. When we say qayyam al value that something. When we say qawwamun, we mean people who rise to take care of something, guardians of something. Why is the Kaaba described as a place of Qiyamah? And why is prayer itself is described as an act of ikama. And why is the hereafter referred to by the word qiyamah? The final day we say the word qiyamah. Well, at the one level is because we all rise from our death to meet our Lord. But qiyamah has, and it explains these various permutations and connotations, is that it has a nuance to it. It's not just the rising of something, and it is not just the rising of something with connoting a value and a meaning. So if you rise aimlessly, you don't do Qiyamah. If you rise unintentionally, it's not Qiyamah. Qiyam is intentional and with vigor and determination and meaning. But furthermore, it always connotes, Qiyam is shay, it always connotes a fresh new start. So when Ibrahim والسلام, refers to his legacy in establishing the Kaaba as a place of Qiyam, we know from the choice of words that this location this location, although it did not happen in the Prophet Ibrahim's lifetime, that this go is going to be a point in which humanity has a new point of demarcation, a new emergence. And in fact, when Allah tells us, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Allah is saying, for at least five times a day, you rise every time to establish a principle and to renew yourself, to affirm yourself in, in God's presence every time that you rise for prayer. We start prayer in standing up in a state of Qiyana. So, even when, the, when Allah, for, for instance, tells us, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ الْقَيِّمِ Rise up, rise up, raise your face, raise your, your, your it's like raise your attention, alert yourself to a philosophy of life 
that is replete with value and meaning. The example, again, a lot insistently describes the religion of Ibrahim and the religion of Islam as a deen of Qayyim and exhorts us to rise وَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكْ Elevate yourself or وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَأَقِمُ الصَّلَاةِ So what, what is this central theme that is all invoked by the word we often repeat until it has become so commonplace that we no longer reflect on it? That word iqama and qiyama. Even when we want to pray jama'ah, we say aqim salah. Salah, which is the backbone of Islam, the pillar of Islam, is not simply a formulaic act of worship that we perform, but it is an entire philosophy of life the reason it is described as the backbone of Islam is that without it, the entire philosophy upon which the Kaaba was founded, upon which the legacy of the Prophet Ibrahim was founded, upon which the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad was founded would mean nothing. Five times a day, we stand up in a state of qiyam or iqama before Allah. Now, notice each time we stand up, we stand up to affirm a philosophy of life and a relationship with the Creator and an entire moral attitude and an entire opportunity to re-engage our consciousness in a way that is decisive and total. So notice for instance, the Fatha that we repeat every raqqa and every prayer, and we repeat so often that a lot of times we repeat it in prayer and we don't even reflect upon what we're saying. But what is so profound is that if you truly reflect on it, you'll find that in the Fatha, which we repeat in every raqqa, is the entire philosophical paradigm, the entire moral paradigm that regulates the relationship between the created and the creator. In many ways, Allah put in this fatha, which we repeat in every raqqa, everything you need to know about your relationship with your creator, and in fact, beyond that, your philosophy, your entire philosophy of life. And that's why prayer is a state of iqama. It's not just, a, we don't just worship by performing rituals. We, in fact, rise with an opportunity to start fresh with a new philosophical and moral commitment every time we rise in prayer. How so? Notice the way we start. Allahu Akbar. We say Allahu Akbar to start prayer. In saying Allahu Akbar, we start by an affirmation. We recognize that we as human beings, we have a choice. And that we have so many choices through our rational faculties that we have the choice to
to do a variety of things, many of them having nothing to do with God or even possibly against God. When we start with this declaration, Allahu Akbar, we make a commitment at the beginning of prayer that we will navigate our lives in light of the principle that the supreme and ultimate adjudicator is God. That we will willingly, voluntarily subjugate our will and our rational faculties and more importantly our egos to God. Then the beginning of the Fatha, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We thank Allah again whose basic character, basic sifat is the most merciful and most compassionate. In this, we are making a commitment and a promise. We are saying we will take hold of our lives, acknowledging the principle that God is the greatest that we are within the boundaries of God's sovereignty. But whatever we do in life, we will do in the name of God. We are the Khulafa, we are the Asians, the Vicegerents, the, the Viceroys, the, the, the inheritors of the earth. But whatever we're going to do in life, we're going to do in the name of God. But we're also making a commitment. We're understanding God that whose name, in, in whose name we are going to act as of all God's possible names, Allah affirms the compassionate, the merciful. So, as we unfold our will on earth, we must reflect the values that Allah taught us. Put it differently. If a Muslim functions in life according to principles, contrary to compassion and mercy, then that Muslim is betraying the trust that God has given to a Muslim. So in, 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 in this, is, this is a huge philosophical paradigm shift. It's Allah is telling you, act in my name. Prayer is an affirmation of a philosophical paradigm that yes I've given you free will but you acknowledge that ultimately you're from me and to me but as you go about acting in my name you are committed to mercy and compassion and mercy and compassion has to be understood within the context of the day and age that you live. Before I told you that light is light, but every age has its different instrumentality for light. So in one age, light only comes from the sun. Another age, light comes from the sun and fire. Another age is the sun and fire and candles and oils. Another age, light comes from the sun, fire, and candles, and oils, and electricity, etc., etc., etc. But light remains light. 
Similarly, mercy and compassion. You cannot say, well, I'm going to act by mercy and compassion, but according to what the way I define mercy and compassion in my legal mind, or in my philosophical mind, or in my anachronistic mind, or in my historical mind. Mercy and compassion has to make sense to the historical moment in which you live. Otherwise, you're misrepresenting God. If, if your acts don't strike people as merciful and compassionate, then that thing where you started out by pay, saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, in the name of God, then you've effectively failed as an agent on behalf of that who gave you your agency. Remember that the concept of Khulafa of of agents, of God, and every time you stand in prayer and you say, Allahu Akbar, you are affirming, I know that I am your agent God. And in prayer, I start out by affirming that what I do in this life, I'm doing in your name. But then what do you reflect? How do you reflect your understanding of your relationship to the maker as you act in God's name? So the most compassionate, the most merciful, and Allah emphasizes this in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, again. When you see Muslims act with cruelty or barbarity, know that they have not understood anything from their prayer. A Muslim's heart is tender with mercy and love, with mercy and compassion. And mercy and compassion is more meaningful than saying, I love. Why? Because you could claim that you love someone and you hurt them because you love them. We see these evangelicals do this all the time. Evangelicals go and say, we love you Muslims, so let's destroy your, let's insult your prophets and let's tear down your Quran and let's break up your families and let's, you know, do, uh, colonialism did what it did is in the name of love. The white man's burden. We love these poor brown people and we want to civilize them. But mercy and compassion is desiring for the other what you desire for yourself. Not as a future act to unfold, but in the here and now. So in other words, it's not that, well, I am educated, so I'm going to force you to go to school so in the future you can be with me. No, I treat you as I want to be treated this minute. That's the heart of mercy and compassion. It is, doesn't look to philosophical justice, but looks to virtue, the, the, the act of elevating suffering and removing suffering in the here and now. That's an important philosophical difference between love, justice, mercy, and compassion. If you're given a choice, and you want to make sure you secure a benefit, you would choose mercy and compassion because it's deliverable right now, not sometime in the future on the premise or presumption of some promised benefit that will come later. Then, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ after you affirm that this 
foundational principle that if you act in the name of Allah, you will act with just with, with compassion and mercy. You affirm the principle that you as a human being, as you steer through the philosophies of life and burdens of life, you look to God for who you worship and who you seek help and refuge from. Now, this is affirmed further when you say, Guide me to the path. Now, here's the issue of the path. In the day and age we live in, the same philosophical challenges that confronted humanity before Islam and in the early days of Islam confront humanity today. There are those who effectively exist a life in which they worship, whether they call it worship or not, pagan-like uh, symbols, or those who worship nature itself as a set of laws that are self-sufficient. And let me explain what I mean by this. Pagan worshipping, or pagans, used to do what? They had a hopeful belief, an irrationally held, non-rational belief, in the intercession of agents, which they called idols, on their behalf with fate. That's what ultimately pagan worship was. Today, there are a lot of people, whether they call themselves paganists or not, they believe in a higher power. And they believe in a higher power in some in the, exactly like the pagans, in some general mystical fashion that is not analytically rigorous. So for instance, they'll believe a lot of people will go ghost hunting. And they'll, they'll, they'll say, oh, there's an afterlife. And they'll even believe, oh, well, you know, these energies that exist in the afterlife, they need to drain batteries when they want to manifest, or they need to drain the energies of the living in order. And they will believe in something like, well, you know, you are in charge if you are ghost hunting, uh, as, you, as you can clearly tell the ghosts that you don't want to be hurt by them, and if your free will, your determination will reign supreme, they can't hurt you, the ghosts. They can't hurt you if you decide that they're not going to hurt you and if you tell them clearly that they should not hurt you. And a belief in ultimately you have your spiritual guide. You have the, the higher power somehow gives you a guiding angel. So a lot of them will say, oh yeah, you know, my mom looks after me. Oh, my husband looks after me. Oh, my dead brother looks after me. You come and you engage them and say, well, okay, so everyone that died lives forever? Everyone that died is looking after their dead one? Well, does it make a difference whether they were good or bad? Well, if it does, does this mean there is hellfire, there is heaven? Is there accountability? You will not find systematic and thorough responses to any of these questions. Their belief system is a hodgepodge of spiritualism that is mystical in nature because it requires leap of faith after leap of faith after leap of faith 
but it doesn't gel together in a coherent vision. So they might believe in karma. They'll tell you, oh, bad karma, good karma. Okay, well, wh who controls the karma? Does this mean that there is a God? That would, Does this mean there is accountability? Well, no, it just works. It's just out there in nature. Exactly like the pagans who believe that the idols somehow, mystic mystically, miraculously. There was a second group of people. Those who worship the laws of nature, like those who worship the sun, or those who worship particular animals, or those who worship the rivers, or those who worship the oceans, they worship nature as nature because they were so fascinated by the laws of nature and elevated the laws of nature into their own deity. These people remind me of the atheists today who believe that there is nothing in the world by the laws of scientific causation and science is their god. Material empirical sciences is their god. And they somehow believe that all these uh, uh, cold, scientifically, empirically based laws of nature function the way they function just because they do function that way and will ever function that way and will always remain to function that way and they rely on that so much so that whatever moral virtues or mor morality they believe in comes simply out of sheer pragmatism and sheer necessity. So in other words, they, they say, well, you know, these are the laws of nature. There's no God. There's no real regulator of this universe. But so wh where do we get our laws? Well, we get our laws simply because people agree that these are the laws. And there's nothing beyond that. The similarities between them and the people of old who used to worship hard core laws of nature symbolized by the sun or symbolized by the moon or symbolized whatever they used to elevate what element or those who worship fire or those who worship water whatever the same type of philosophical orientation now take a muslim when a muslim says guide me to the straight path the path not of irrational mysticism, the, the voodoo type were believers, the, the paganist type believers who believe in, in, in loose mysticism and a higher power, but, in, in, but ultimately no concrete philosophical vision, and the past of what we today call the materialists, what in the past were the naturists. The path of those who believe that nature, mother nature, whatever that particular element of nature they deified, is independent and supreme. So you are the, the affirmative prayer that you make to Allah is that straight path to keep you on that straight path. And to be on that straight path the path of recognizing that there is an owner to this world. There is a Malik Yawmuddin. There is a, a Lord of the world. And that your intellect and your heart is subject to the Lord. And your aspiration to make your intellect and your ego subject to that Lord. And that the path of that Lord is a path of mercy and compassion and that you are seeking you you plead with Allah to maintain you on a path that is often difficult because the temptations the, the, we, the, the temptations of philosophical confusion especially in our day and age all you have to do is just spend some time on YouTube and you could become very confused unless you, you are remarkably solid.
because every idiot now has access to post whatever idiocy they wish on YouTube. And, and, and in my view, you should deal with YouTube, or not just YouTube, but the net generally. The same way when the Prophet would tell us, lower your gaze. In the old days, you could walk in the street, and if you see something tempting, you lower your gaze. In our day and age, lowering the gaze means don't click on things on the net that would be the equivalent of in the old days of gawking and staring at things you shouldn't be staring at. And if you click on sites, and I'm not just me, I don't just mean pornographic sites, I mean sites that will pollute your inner spirit and your intellect. It doesn't have to be pornography because there's intellectual pornography. When, when any idiot can, who has not gone through a process of vetting, no intellectual credentials, no process of, it just gets to, and, and our nature as human beings in the same way that if we are in the street, what would normally catch our attention? It's the crazy people on the street, naked people on the street, obscene people on the street. These are the people where require you to lower your gaze the most, right? If you're on the street and someone is running around naked, that's the person you want to stare at. But that's when also you need to lower your gaze. The same thing on today's net. Who's going to grab your attention? It's the most scandalous. It's the most entertaining. It's the most funny. It's the most loud. It's the most obnoxious. That's when the Salat al-Mustaqim needs to, to kick in. That's when you need to lower your gaze by saying, you know, I don't need, and that's really the true meaning of fitna. It's not whether you know, a woman is in a mosque and covering her hair or not. That is nothing compared to the fitna that happens on the net. When you click on some moron who is spewing stuff, you know, the, you have, in order to, you know, things, uh, there are people like, that uh, say horrible things about the Prophet Muhammad and in order to sit there and try to verify what they're saying or even to re respond, or it will take you hours and hours in your life that you don't have. So what, what do you have normally do? You normally just listen to it and then it bothers you. And although you might tell yourself, well, oh, this is nonsense, but it still eats away at your heart like a demon. Exactly like seeing a naked person and, and walking around in the street. Although at the time you might look and pretend like it didn't affect you, later on in your life, the imagery and the images stay with you. So when Allah tells you, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ guide us to the straight path. That is an affirmation of a commitment that you will struggle to keep your intellect and your heart pure. That you undertake at least five times. And that is why Allah then goes on to say, well, who are those people on the straight path? What are Dalin, those who have not gone astray, and those who have not earned God's alienation and wrath. You're not going to earn God's wrath by doing small mistakes. But you are going to earn God's wrath by veering off the straight path, by allowing the pollution of your mind where Allah becomes sort of just a higher power. Not the, not the Lord of the, of the heavens and earth, where the, the belief that of the final day and final accountability and the final justice is not firm and clear in your heart. You will earn Allah's wrath if you yourself don't conduct yourself with mercy and compassion. Why? Because you think you're implementing the law or you think that you're implementing text 
or you think that you are upholding this or that or obeying a, 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 a boss or a king or a president or whatever. The fact that Allah gave us everything and that is why gave us the key to life and that is why Ibrahim والسلام, the Prophet Ibrahim when he directed us to Mecca when, when, he, when he set the, 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 the foundations for Mecca Mecca was a, an affirmation of a philosophy of life to humanity and the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, came and affirmed the same philosophy again like all the, the prophets to humanity an affirmation that is encapsulated in the five prayers iqamat as salam every time we stand and say allahu akbar god is greater greater than my ego greater than my desires greater than my intellectual journeys and 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 fantasies greater than kings greater than rulers greater than 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 philosophies i commit myself to the principle of god's lordship and i live my life in god's name and when i act in god's name i act with mercy and compassion towards all and I worship only God and I seek the assistance of God and I pray for the straight path, the path of lowering the gaze, the path of determination and in that is true life. That is the emergence, what the iqama to shit. That is why we refer to prayer when we say Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala falah. Prayer in itself is equated with the very notion of renewal and vigor and energy. Allahumma afanna wa rahamna wa usamna wa yastajwana. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. الله أكبر والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وطلب بحسن إلى يوم الدين ولأنها لبسبيل مقيم مقيم something a path that will grant you will gift you an energy for life itself prayer prayer the reason it is described as the backbone of islam amud al-islam is that islam becomes entirely meaningless without it and if you perform it while not reflecting on the enormous amounts of commitments that you undertake, you miss the opportunity of learning from prayer. If you pray five times a day, your entire day is organized around your relationship with Allah. And if you pray in the true meaning of prayer, if you truly reflect, the minute you say Allahu Akbar, you, you reflect upon what that means, that God is the greater and greatest in your life. And that whatever you do in your work, in your life, in your family, in, in everything, you do in Allah's name. And that you are required to act with mercy and compassion towards all 
and that you commit yourself to Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path. You commit yourself the affirmative will to keep your heart and intellect pure. So what does that mean? It means if you have toxic people in your life, you commit yourself to steering away from them. If you have toxic influences in your life, you commit yourself to removing them. If you have toxic habits in your life, you commit yourself to changing them. Because the straight path requires work. You, yes, you're asking Allah's assistance. But Allah tells you that Allah only helps those who help themselves. So you can't live in toxicity and then say, Allah, why haven't you helped me remain in the straight path? You need to help yourself. You need to help yourself to maintain yourself on that straight path. Not the path of irrational spiritualism and not in the path of cold materialism. Both are lethal. Now, notice that first in Salah, after we pray, that we say the Fatha and say the Ayah, the Surah, we, and we perform our Rukua, the act of Rukua, and we say Subhana Rabbi Al Azim, praise to Allah the Greatest. The act of Rukua, in generally in 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 the in Near Eastern religions, but particularly in monotheistic religions, that the act of bending, bowing like this. It meant two things. It meant giving allegiance. So that's why more, you know, when you appeared before a king, you bowed. You're saying, I give you my allegiance. But in Islamic theology, it had a further meaning. And that is, you're also saying, this intellect that I know is a huge gift. After all, that's the qalam. Qalam is al-aqr. And Allah gave the aqr, which is the greatest gift of all. But I know that the aqr could lead me into a lot of trouble. And so I am symbolically affirming that I will utilize this aqr with the acknowledgement of you, so your supremacy and your sovereignty God. That's the Rukur. And that is why we rise after the Rukur and after say, oh, Subhana Rabbi Al Azim, Allah the Great. We affirm before the total immersion and subjugation in sujood, we say, Sama Allah al Muhammad. Allah listens to those who acknowledge Allah. Rabbana wa lakal hamd. So we, we do Qiyam again, we rise up again, preparing for the ultimate act of saying our heart and our mind and our entire body is subjugated to you, Allah. And that's the act of sujood. We could go on with the Salat Ibrahimiyya and the various meanings, but that is not the, the main point. The main point is that Islam without Salah is empty, meaningless. When you find people say, oh yes, I am a Muslim, but they don't pray. You know, of course, in terms of their accountability in the hereafter, that's to Allah. But theologically, philosophically, I don't know what, what that means. Salah is what gives meaning to what Islam is. And Islam is a commitment not to die. It's a commitment to live life exercising 
the power of agency that Allah gave you on this earth. You are so important that Allah gave you this, this, this power of attorney, this khilafah, to act on behalf of Allah in the name of Allah. If you want to discharge it, act with mercy and compassion towards everything. Last khutbah, I gave the example of these Syrians who save orphans and save animals, cats and dogs. Look at the way they understood Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, unfolding mercy. If you unfold cruelty and bloodshed and pain and agony, then Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim doesn't mean anything to you. And you acknowledge that life does include so many temptations and what you desire is to remain on the straight path. And remaining on the straight path is a deliberate act of jihad. It's not a cruise control act. It's not something that just unfolds by itself. But it's something that you work towards. We repeat the Fatha and we repeat the Salah five times a day. Many of us just go on automatic and many of us don't even think of the seriousness of what they are committing to every time they do their Salah. Of course, it's much worse than those who don't even do the commitment and don't do the Salah. Because then they're, they're just, you know, leaves in the wind. They're, they're just blowing in the wind like everyone else. Or even worse, you know, those who are, have been touched by the demonic and they go around aimlessly, pointlessly. That's even worse than the aimless. But one leads to the other. If you, if you, if you are not in Allah's path, then you drift. And you, if you drift, eventually the demonic could be waiting for you. Eventually, in due time, you just fall in the lap of the demonic. And every time you see people killing and murdering and blowing things up, and these people drifted until they fell in the lap of the demonic. Because if sad for our destruction and death and suffering and torture and oppression is all demonic, our Salah is the heart of our religion and it is the most important thing we do in our entire day it should be the center of our day it is our relationship with Allah and because Allah promises us that this life is nothing but vanity and it is the umbilical cord until you live the next life, which Allah promises us is the real life. Remember that Islam, Iqamat al Salah, established an entire civilization. The civilization of Muslims. Wherever you go where Islam has built a civilization, you, you, the earmark of it is what? Mosques, Azan, and Salah. That, that's, that's like the, 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 the symbol. And the same thing like in Christianity, it's a cross. In Islam, it's the Azan and the Salah. And people who understood or who had the Salah impact their life and their spirit transformed the world. Like a lot of people before us, like a lot of nations before us, Muslims have lost the passion that Salah is supposed to ignite in them. And I don't think that Allah will grace us with the blessings that we desire until we reflect once again of this commitment, this essential component that we undertake in Iqama, in, in, in the renewal of the principle of life itself, 
إن إقامة الصلاة اللهم اعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا واجعلنا من المحسنين المصلحين يا رب العالمين Allah forgive our sins Allah grant us your guidance Allah make us your true agents on the straight path in compassion and mercy ya Allah wa akum